for the introduction, and I think we will get right into the subject matter. There are three things that we want to discuss, or I will discuss. First, the chronological history of Pompeii. This is something that I presented here two years ago. So I think I see new faces here, so it doesn't hurt to present it again. And then I will discuss a little bit about uh, Pompeii and Pompeians perception of their history. That is, we don't go by chronology, but we segment our history in periods or eras. And then uh, finally I will discuss the what I call the cultural context of Pompeian indigenous history. Uh, and I think some of you I've already known this, but uh, we will do it again. Uh, my talk will be based on a paper that I wrote some years ago. There was a forum of leaders, specific leaders, that was held here. And I was asked to uh, talk to the wives of the leaders about Pompeian history. So the audience was different. and. I hope uh, that some of you will learn something from this. And I have a copy of that paper here. So if you would like to, you, will, you can make copies of the paper from here. I cannot go without uh, saying that at the outset of this paper, I would like to let you know that I'm not an expert in Ponape and Patapat. How many of you are from here? I know two of you. All of you, right? Or, okay, Patapat simply means uh, oral history. Oral refers to history. But for the Ponape and here, why, what is Patokati means? What is when you when you Patok something? What, what is it? Yes, it's to plant or to propagate, right? Uh, what, what is the relationship between to plant or propagate something and oral history or patapat? Well, think about it because it's very important as far as leading into how Ponapeans think of their history and how they organize their thoughts on history. Uh, but I also would like to preface my talk with a convention or the way a Ponopean oral historian would, would talk. So who knows what I should say first. Conventionally all oral historians in Pompeii will begin by saying what? Piraki may pa or what I'm going to say is not straight and for those of you who know more you should make it straight. Okay, this really is a confession. And then at the end of every story, what did they say? They say, I say what Roro, right? Which means what? Okay, my story is carried forward or forth. This has a lot of meaning. That is, the oral historian is requesting your understanding and he's asking us that if he dies, or one generation dies, the story of the Ponopeans will keep going, right? The stories will carry forward. And that's what he meant by, I say what, Roro. Uh, let me give you a definition of history that I selected from many definitions. Because I think this one carries, is brought, and should be brought enough to handle all the aspects of Pompeii. And this definition is by Dietz, an historian and an anthropologist at the same time. And he said this in 1988, so he said, history is projected contemporary thought, projected contemporary thought about past actuality. Right? This thought is integrated and synthesized 
in context, in terms of culture, sequence of time, and contemporary values and interests. So I think I select this definition because I think uh, it has, we can apply this to Monopoly and history. When, when I talk about the sequence of time or the chronological history, you will note that it is done by us archaeologists doing the work of an archaeology. That is, we find physical evidence that relates to the time period or the uh, radiocarbon dating that we found. So maybe we can start with the chronology. Um, Chronology of one piece history. Let's say about 10 million years ago, the island started to be formed. And you all know how the volcanic islands uh, started to result the volcanic eruption. And this date is, let me see, there's one geologist who came with us and he looked at the, the basalt rocks, the types, and he indicated that this looks like an, an old island, let's say, compared to Koshrai, compared to Hawaii. And he comes up with this number of 10 million years. But I have yet to, uh, to see, and maybe some of you have seen, geological work that will give us more absolute dates on that. At any rate, let's use this. About 10 million years ago, the island was formed. About 10,000 years ago, everything on the island that you know of is already formed. All the mountains, Nanalaut and whatnot, all the major drainages, all of the mangrove around the island, all of these things were formed about 10,000 years ago. And humans came in at the finished island only about what? Only about 2,000 years ago, or three, pushing it. So we are newcomers to an island that must have been beautiful and already formed. Uh, that's so we worked on various uh, areas of Pompeii and we came up with this uh, chronological scheme. Uh, there was one area in Nawak we call Len Luk. Len Luk is really a, a swampy sort of uh, pool that existed in that in that place, and we uh, collected collected some charcoal samples from that, and it gave us date of BC before Christ. This is about the first century before Christ. So we put down it's possible <coughs> that people were here during the uh, BC time up to 500 BC. But we have yet to confirm that by finding radiocarbon dates that match this date. But we know that the first century before Christ, somebody burned something in Wu, maybe land clearing, and resulted in charcoal being deposited in the area. That's where we got the date. And the area we work on is called Painais. So we call the Painais phase as the time period from one time of Christ to uh, about 100, 180. What we found at this time is breadfruit pit, that's mar, cal, house foundation, use of columnar results was evident at that time, and Nukora and Kapingamarang is settled at about the same time by Polynesians migrating to our area. Next one. The next one is, of course, the nematode phase, and we all, there was a mistake. It was not uh, 100, 1 to 100. It's 1 to 1,000, the previous slide. So between 1,000 AD and 1,500 AD, we know that the use of pottery declined from the archaeological deposits. Southern leadership and the center of influence was at nematode this time. 
we assume that there was a large population at that time. Uh, not only there is not, uh, well, how do I put it? It's not a complete assumption. What we did was that we measured some of the house platforms at Nambato. Uh And the number of people that we use residing in one, one of the house platforms uh, is a guess. But it gives us a number that is probably close to reality. That is Nanmadol itself. Have you been to Nanmadol, any of you? You've been there? Okay, throughout all of the 90 some islands. Uh, what we calculated is that 2,000 people could have lived there and worked there at any one time. If you have 2,000 people living there and working there, you can, well, you don't have to extrapolate. You can make a fairly good guess that Pompey Island was fairly, the population was fairly large at that time. In addition to this, generations of Ponopens were building Nanmatol at that time. And we know there is, uh, based on calculation of how much volume of heavy material is brought there and used, that a lot of people were involved in the construction of Nanmatol itself. Uh, and elaborate residential places were, uh, were apparent in Nanmatol at that time. Next one. Okay, the Isogolokal or Namaki face curve, or we put it between 1500 AD and 1800 AD. Uh, the Namaki polity emerged, use of pottery disappeared, and South Alur leadership changed from single ruler of the island to how many rulers? How many municipalities do we have now? We have five, right? Each is headed by Namaki. Before we get the five, there were three uh, municipalities after the... Uh, who conquered South Ulu dynasty? Isogolokal, yes. And Isogolokal became our first landmark uh, And I think that occurred, my guess, is around 14 or 1500. Yeah, remember, Guam was visited by foreigners uh, in the 1500s. And we, could, we couldn't find much of the description in, our, uh, in the records that indicate that something was going on in Pompey at that, at that time. But it's very possible uh, around 14, 1500 AD was the shift from one single ruler to more rulers. There is some good stories documented in the oral histories about this. Next one. Okay, the formation of the way or municipalities occur. Which one came first? Of course, Batalanim was because Isokoloko was from there. Uh, which one came second? Okay, U municipality came second. The third was Kiti municipality, and then Sokes and Nut. Sokes and the Naramakis were bestowed in Sokes and Nut only during the Japanese time, more recent. Okay. Now, when you get up to speak to people, how do you, what is the order in which you say you are? commitment or your recognition of people. You begin with the Namargi of Metheleni first, and then after that Namargi of Hu, then the Namargi of Kiti, Namargi of Sokes, and then the Namargi of Net as the last one. That follows the, the order of who became uh, the first Namargi municipality all the way to the last one. So Kebun Ivan Kuburan Nisibab, after that, you go through Samoro, you go through Saukisa, you go through both, uh, rather both, yeah, now Trapagania, and then finally you go through Japanmat. And that follows the order of. Next one. 
Okay, from 1800 to the present, we have the Boston missionaries coming in in 1852, Spanish period, 1886 to 1889, German period followed, Japanese and then the American period. Uh, there's something wrong with what I put there. Can anybody tell me 1945 to present? Are we still under the... Uh, so, what is the correct date? I think it's 1979, if you want to uh, say that we became uh, sort of like independent uh, after 19, uh, well not after, but 1979. So this is a summary of the chronological history, and we'll spend some time talking about periods and eras. That's going to be looking at the, the time sequence. Uh, before I go on, do you have any questions? I think these are something said. Yes? And this was under which principality before it was named as the principality. What was it? Uh, before that? Or yeah, what was it? Was yeah. it under any principality? No. But it was a dispersed polity. So you have Kama as one, you have other areas. And I just wrote a small book on Kichi. And Kichi was not unified until around the time of the Sokolakan. Prior to that, there were Kala, there was Kichi, there was Anola, and there was Salapu. There were four of them. Only around the time of the Sokolakan is the entire place unified after one war in Kitty. So each of the municipalities would have, I think, similar type of history. Good question. Any other ones? And, and I would encourage all of you to look into this and to start writing. You noted that I put up Lowell and Bernard as contributing about a hundred narratives. And what I'm talking about is based on on what he wrote. He was an unusual, not an unusual. His frame of mind was really kind of like Western. Yeah? He was really talking about a progressive country. That's evolutionary thinking. You know, there are some people who, and I don't think that uh, other oral historians in Pompey have the same frame of mind. But uh, Llewellyn Bernard, if you look at his book, he claimed that we were living under the rocks. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, from simple to more complex in time. But uh, when he wrote that about we were probably living under rocks, it kind of came to my mind that he must have been influenced by some, some kind of a Western thinking. And he put the most enlightened period is coincide with the development or always with Christianity for that matter. And so he's thinking that we were simple and then we became more complex and the most complexity we can get is to become to have faith in God. I'm not saying that he's wrong. But that's the way his brain works, and that's how it comes out in his book, right? And later on, uh, as we discuss more, uh, it, will, it will come out to be like that. So, any other questions? I will just look at the chronology based on archaeological record, and all of the record indicated that, not indicated, but something that is non-perishable, something that is, uh, it can remain in the ground for a long time, that gives you some evidence of what pottery for one thing, and then other non-perishable material. What about the Pompeians? How were they thinking about their history? What kind of evidence do they have to claim these? It's very hard to, to interpret, but let me just go through this and you can think about it. Okay, based on my study of the Pompeian oral traditions, 
By the way, I use indigenous history and oral traditions uh, as the same. Maybe they are different. Uh, it appears that, as I just mentioned, Lowell and Bernard and another key of brothers, uh, they, they, they were thinking in evolutionary terms, right? They believe in a progressive society. You go from less complex to more complex in time. Uh, these two, three oral historians have this frame of mind. Uh, the Pontypridd oral historian Dolan Bernard started writing his book in the 1930s, and then his Pontypridd book was translated and published in 1977. And he mentioned in his book, and I quote, his work, or my book, or my work, informs us about how the rains, Mohican, and times improved for the reign of enlightenment, enlightenment, Mohin Marai, has been always increasing. This is a quote indicating what he was thinking in terms of the progressive European society. Anyway, I like the chronological history scenario that I presented. The Pompeian oral historians do not label their periods and their eras with absolute dates. They simply segmented the 2,000 years of history of occupation and accomplishments into what is called Mui or eras. Each era or period is named and the eras are sequentially ordered. The Pompeians did not develop any calendar but they had time reckoning, which is fairly accurate, based on the relationship between the celestial bodies, the sun, the moon, based on the birds when they start singing in the evening and in the morning, based on many of the natural things around them. It's just that they didn't write any of this down, and as a result of that, I think, they were not able to put together things that would be more like a calendar. But they had a fairly good time working. So the, uh, the Pontypridd terms that are used for periods or era are Anso, that is time. But anybody know what the literal translation of Anso is? If I give you a hint, So means sun. What about An means what? To be familiar with, right? So Anso you put together means to be familiar with the sun. And Mue or Mue Pasang is segmented, separated. Uh, that's where the term Mue comes from. And these two uh, terms are used to mean period or time with no time or with no absolute numbers affiliated with them. According to the oral traditions, again, as I point out who I got this information from, there were, there are four periods in Pompeian history. These are known as Moin Kawa, ancient times, first, first period. Moin Saudalo or Saudalo Siro, the second period. Moin Nan Marki or Moin Isogurta, which means is over this time, or this is the third period. And after this, what is the fourth? The only four. Following the Narmarki era is what? Everybody know? Main Y. Main Y. That is the fourth uh, era, right? Uh, that's the fourth era. The fourth period is divided into, can anybody tell me? Yeah. You. Okay, Moin Spain, Spanish. Moin Salmon, German figure. Moin Zapan, right? Japanese. And Moin Amar, that's American period. Uh, yeah. This is fun, right? <laughs> uh, 
You know, sometimes I used to think that we know English much better than our language. So when I when I started saying the point to him, we kind of got lost, right? We soon as say it's German to it. <laughs> All right. The recorded Potipan narratives and the contemporary oral historian accounts of what transpired during each of these periods vary. They differ, but there is a lot of agreement in what the oral historians say. I will briefly discuss Duol and Bernard's scheme in this, okay? But before I do that, let me explain, because Duol and Bernard and Louis, Kio, Louis and Warren Kio are brothers. But they were oral historians that gave Hamburg in about 1910. A lot of the stories that I, in turn, studied and presented to you. But who is collecting directly oral, history, oral histories today? This gentleman here has collected a lot. See, when I talk about oral histories, I talk about things that were collected already. In rare cases, or in very few cases, where I go and directly talk with the oral historian. But uh, this person talked to oral historians all the time, and he's recording. So, Louise and Warren Keo are brothers. Hamburg recorded many stories from them in 1910. They were members of the Tibunwai clan. Their mother's name was Litakana, and she married an American from New York by the name of Joe Keo. Europeans remember this character by the name of Sokio. Sokio. Sometimes it sounds more like a title to me. Anyway, Sokio jumped ship and he came and decided he wanted to settle in Pompeii at Nantamaro in Maglani. The Takana's father was a member of the Bunman Potapot clan from Maglani and from Mokot. Now, the Gunman Potipot until now are very well known for uh, keeping Polyphene oral histories. So, Warren and Louis Kio, I think, are interested in oral histories because of their uncle, or their, their mother's father. Their mother was the Gunwai, they, they were members of the Gunwai, but their grandfather, their mother's father, was the Gunman Potipot. So, I think. There is a connection here, so Louise and Warren Keo. Apparently, Cho Keo was also known, uh, also recorded some oral, oral uh, histories. Llewellyn Bernard was a member of the Lipitan clan. I don't see anybody from Kitchi here, from Wena, so I won't ask. I just let you know. Uh, Llewellyn Bernard was a member of the Lipitan clan from Kitchi. His father was a member of the Dibunman clan. His grandson, Masao Hatli, inherited a great deal of oral history information from Duol and Bernard. And then, as I indicated before, uh, <coughs> Duol and Bernard started writing his book in the 1930s. And it was published in, uh, uh, oh, you can put up those. Yeah. It was published in 1977. Uh, Lord Bernard also discussed in his book some interesting things that happened during the fourth period. But I, I don't include this in my paper. I talked about things that he put in the first, second, and third periods. Okay, the first thing that occurred, well, oral historians that I consulted, they were all agreed about the construction, building of Tonpe. Okay, the idea was that there was a naked rock just jutted out of the ocean and it goes right up. And then the sacred construction of Tonpe occurred. People were involved and the deities were involved. So people were able to bring soil, old stories, uh, kind of things that they brought to actually build or constructed Pompeii. 
when I reviewed Wolan Bernard's book, or when I thought about it, there are four general episodes of history reflected in his work or his narrative. These include, as I said, the construction and building of Pompey Island, initial and subsequent settlement from the directions east, west, and south. There was social organization development in his discussions, and finally, there was religious belief or ideology development in his scheme. Several narratives of the first period in his book pertain to the sacred construction in the beginning, as I said before, but it's important to point out that because humans were involved in the building of the island, the, is the island is sometimes called Pompeiu. What is Pompeiu? It has a connotation of a sovereign Pompey. Literally, Pompeiu means erect Pompey. That, that, it's nothing about bad words. Pompeiu was jut right out and uh, it was kind of sovereign, strong sovereign. And then there was another thing that we'll discuss at this time by the oral historians. And these are uh, protection of the island and they, they continue to be uh, the foundation of a lot of our environmental protection. So the island is protected from the large ocean waves by the barrier reef. In this context, the barrier reef is known as Katangan Ot or Katangan Sept, where Katang means to hold together or to secure, and Sept means ocean or sea. The fringing mangrove forest is referred to as Katangan E or Katangan Ak. And again, the mangroves serve as a protection of the island. There is a find that usually grow on the shoreline. I forget the name of that. That is known as Katanganya, or the protection of the shorelines. And who can tell me what the uh, what protected the soil from eroding? What kind of tree? What kind of plant? That is called Katanganya. I'll let you go and do research. It's banyan tree. Before you see these big trees with large roots hanging down, uh, they apparently were numerous along the uh, sloping areas of the land. So, Ayao? Ayao, yeah. Ayao. Uh, I thought that the oral historians who were putting these things together um, were telling us, we take care of our land. What about you people? Do you? Or you don't? Uh, this uh, protection, conservation kind of philosophy or thinking is interesting that they came along quite early on with the oral historians. Okay, so we know during the first period initial settlement of the island also occurred. Bernard and other oral historians whose work I had read and consulted agree that how many voyages were made to Pompeii? Does anybody know? Did your teachers tell you? <laughs> you and Bernard indicated that there were seven voyages that were made to Pompeii during the settlement phase, but the first period include construction and settlement of the island. The first voyage was by a woman by the name of Mary. Who or wrong? The first voyage, uh, during the first voyage, one woman was left behind so she can populate the island and the name of the one woman is Dumaitu, Dumaitu, right? Uh, the characters Konopol and Rukaropol came during the second second period or second voyage and they did not return to their original land. They helped the construction of the island and the people, apparently the people were not using houses. This is Bernard speaking. They were living in 
uh, simple shelters. The legendary characters Bakulap, Bakutuk, Shortuk, Shalap arrive on the island on the third voyage. Again, according to Roland Bernard, phone parents who are living in simple shelters. The le legendary character of Machariat arrived on the island on the fourth voyage. He was known for bringing and cultivating ivory, not African ivory, oz. Okay? There's something about oz that, that, that uh, kind of struck me as interesting. I tried to take these uh, ivory oz to push right, never can grow them. I was there for about a year working there. Every time I come here, I take this thing back there so I can. Because I thought the environment was. They would just grow up and then die down. Anyway. During the fifth voyage, it was a returning voyage. By the way, they tried to get Lumuetu back at this voyage. But Lumuetu refused. And she said, I'm not going back because I have descendants here, right? And he also said, uh, you go back and I'll stay and die here. So what happened when she died? She became the founder of Tubunman. The reason why we called Tubunman was because the Muertu turned into a little bird. I don't know what kind of bird. Bird is referred to as man. So what, what is interesting here? Well, what is happening here? It's a matrilineal society, and this woman was saying, or this woman was actually the founder of the first clan. So, my interpretation is that they are starting to, or at least uh, some kind of a social organization development was happening at this time. Uh, uh, during the fifth period or uh, voyage. And I also think that the term Utak and Pulitak probably came around this time. What is Utak uh, and Pulitak? Pulitak means people who float in or people who come in from outside. And Pulitak are the people who claim that they were part of the soil and they were also with the God. That's why what, uh, well, there are some clans that claim that they are Utak. This includes the Bunman, Basiala, Putron, the Bulat, and the Bulu. These five clans out of 13 clans of Ponte claim that they are Utak. You know, we were first here, we came with the soil, and so they call the priority of things. They, they claim as the uh, very good. They're not men white. They, they did not come in, like the rest of the clan members who are referred to as Pulita. Pulita means to float in or to come in to the area. Uh, I, my own thinking is that such terms or such ideas probably came around the fifth voyage. And this time, there was a, another character named Messia. Uh, he was the one who brought fire to Pompeii. The narrative of the sixth voyage em emphasized characteristics of the emerging social organization and family structures of this narrative also inform us of how the Pompeians organized themselves uh, on a local, localized settlement of the island. The following, so what becomes clear is probably the establishment of matrilineal uh, base enclaves or units. People who were early on settlement, not organized fully into a full swing political areas, but probably small matrilineal uh, enclaves. So, places like Saunalang, Wanuk, Awak, Tupandangala, Piganiap, Sopai, Palakur, Perlang, Salapuk, Kitri, Onolang, 
All of these appear in the oral traditions earlier on as units or, or enclaves. And they're not affiliated with the idea of Madhani include these concepts or Kitri include these. There were no five municipalities but different smaller units. I also associate this period with major developments in religion or religious belief system on the island. This is because, by the way, we were only on the sixth voyage. Who came to Pompeii on the last voyage? Seven. Olesoba and Olesipa. They came to Pompeii last on the seventh voyage. And Olosoba and Olesiva, of course, they, when they came to Bombay, they started looking for a place of their ceremonies and worship. They started in Sokes, didn't, didn't fare out well, moved northeastward until they came to Nanmato. And that's where they settled. And what's the name of the religious or religion that they formed and established? It's Nanusun Sap. Nanusun Sap is a combination of the worship of representatives of the gods from the sea, which is sea terrible, and also the representative of the gods from, from the land, right? And so you have Murayil, uh, Nan Samur, Moi Samur, uh, worshipped in Nanmadol until the 1800s. And you also have uh, turtles caught and were fed to. So these are representatives of the spirits from, from the sea. And that's what Nani Swansap really means. Who became the first South Alone? Olesoba or Olesipa? Oh, you will be tested on this man. <laughs> I'm just kidding, these are for our interest. Of course, Olesoba apparently became the first South Alone of the island and the last there were apparently 17 South Alouks. We would remember only the names of 14 of them. And we have that in the oral histories. But the last one was called Sokonamo, the last South Alouk. Sokonamo means demanding of the era. That is, this person apparently demanded a lot from the people of Tonpe. Probably that's one of the reasons why the South Alor dynasty was conquered. So it became cruel. So when the South Alor Sakonomoy was conquered, what happened next? Who came from Koshrai? Who is from Koshrai? Apparently Sokolgar came from the east. We don't know where, but people like to think of Koshrai. It's a place where Isogolgol came. Isogolgol, cultural hero, came, conquered South Alok, and then uh, dispersed the simple political entity. And he became the, he became the uh, first landmark of country. Kiyo, let me just briefly mention because we're running out of time. Not Kiyo, yeah, Kiyo brothers. They had similar scheme as Gore and Verna, right? Except for one thing. They inserted in their periods, and what happened to the periods, that apparently a large flood occurred on Pompeii, and then there was repopulation of the island after the flood. The flood. Right? What do you think of that? Luis Kiyo lived during the... I think he probably was influenced by Noah Zark. I, I, that's my word. But I mean, I put ideas in your mind. <laughs> okay, um, let me go on. The cultural context of Pompeian history. 
I think that it is not enough for us to simply appreciate and learn history in order to broaden our knowledge of places, times, events, and happenings of the world. It is not enough for us to study and understand history only for the sake of preservation. See, we are a part of a continuous stream of events that make history. So, it's fair for us to claim that we remember, we learn our history, but we also live our history. And I think Contents had some ideas of this. I think that the Bonapens history, including the knowledge of happenings and events, the transmission of this knowledge from one generation to another, and the appropriate use of the knowledge of history is a way of life, subjected to conventions, subjected to rules and regulations of a society. By the way, I make reference to the use of history. How do you people, how do we use history? That is, we go read the books, and then we take a test, we pass or we don't pass. How, how, how do you use, or what is the practice of history? Yeah, he was going to say something. <laughs> All right, in front of him, uh, well, society, let me say. See, during a conflict of interest, yeah? when there was fighting, or somebody killed somebody else, and there was the custom of apology done, there will be an oral historian there who will be able to stand up and say, you people are related through this. And that kind of eased the tension right away. So that's one way of using history. Whether that person was telling the truth or not is not the main thing. The main thing is let's use history for the, for the purpose of pacifying or easing the tension. And I think we're coming to an end. Uh, I would like to say one final thing, that is, when I was working on this paper, I used at least 10 books and papers to get my ideas from, right? In retrospect, I didn't consult any of my elders or any of the oral historians and I, I regret that because it should have been done. In the end, libraries, internet, whatever, they win out. But I'd like to ask you that in whatever you do, please remember to consult our elders and our oral historians. They have a lot more wisdom than we do. So thank you very much. Your attention. We have a little bit of time, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to. Well, again, thank you. I think we continue on to tell stories to start reading. Thank you again. And as I said, here is a copy of the paper if you want to make a copy for you, go ahead and do it.